transmission. Okay, thank you, Roy. Thanks, Mairead. Um, thanks, Tracy. Um, and I will now try and share my screen, which should uh, should work, and we can start the uh, presentation. I'll just pop it onto presenter mode, and, uh, and we should be free to go. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, I understand there's a lot of people there, so it's it's good to have uh, a large number of people showing an interest in this really really important area, really important microorganism. Um, what I'm going to cover today is shigatoxin producing E. coli uh, and try and give you the state of knowledge of, of where we are at the moment, um, touching on, on some of the newer publications and thought processes towards the, the uh, toxicity and virulence of various types of shigatoxin producing E. coli, and also touching on methodology as well at the end. So first of all, um, what about E. coli? Um, we, are, we often get uh, sort of uh, caught up with what E. coli actually is. Oops, sorry, I've just uh, just popped back. Uh, previous slide. There we go. Um, we always get get caught up in what E. coli is, and and are all E. coli pathogenic? And of course, the answer is no. Not all E. coli are pathogenic. Um, if we go and, and just look at some basic publications, um, the human gut flora, the human contents of the human gut, gut flora contains somewhere in the region of around 10 to the 11 bacteria per gram. That's 100,000 million bacteria per gram of, of gut contents. And estimates would suggest that somewhere around about 0.1% of those are E. coli. So we may have somewhere around about 10 to the 8, 100 million E. coli per gram in our guts. That would tend to indicate that we're all probably feeling fairly well at the moment. These things are not all pathogenic. If we take in a side look at the uh, European Microbiological Criteria for Foods, the legislation on micro criteria, which is uh, Regulation 2073 2005, and just look at some of the criteria that are noted there, there's, there's one criterion for cheeses made with heat treated milk that will give allowable levels of, of 1000 per gram. Uh, e. coli in some types of sample. Likewise, if we looked at the, the criteria for butter made from raw milk, that would give allowable levels of up to 100 uh, uh, E. coli per gram in some types of sample. And in those cases, E. coli isn't being uh, used or looked for as a pathogen. It's being used as an indicator of good or poor hygiene. So the general answer to that is no, not all E. coli are pathogens. Some are uh, form the natural microflora of the gut, and some are being used as, as hygiene indicators in, in foods and food production. But there are a range of very bad E. coli around there, uh, out there, and, and these can cause um, a range of types of illness that will go from mild traveler's diarrhea, and that will usually be caused by, by E. coli, uh, when you move around and you get these, this mild discomfort, right through to the very drastic illness that can be caused by Shiga toxin producing E. coli. I suppose firstly, when we think about STEX, um, we should look a little bit about what are STEX, what are their history? I mean, the first thing to, to go through is some people might be still reading or even using the term VTEX, virocytotoxin producing E. coli. And those two words, those two um, acronyms, VTEC and STEC, absolutely identical. They mean exactly the same group of microorganisms. So as I'm going through saying STEX, if you're used to using the term VTEX, same thing, don't worry about it. So let's have a look a little bit about the history. It's always interesting to go back into the history of, of uh, microbiology. And we go back right back to 1885, um, when um, uh, I think an Austrian uh, bacteriologist, Theodor Escherich, um, actually isolated uh, what he called bacterium coli um, from outbreaks of neonatal dysentery. This organism over the course of time uh, gradually got rena renamed uh, in honor of Theodore Escherich and it became known as Escherichia coli. If we then take a, a side look at the whole area of Shiga toxin, uh, again, back in 1898, we got a Japanese bacteriologist, Shiga, uh, Kiyoshi Shiga, who described Shiga's bacillus, which we now know as Shigella dysentery. And he described the toxic effects of extracts, cell-free extracts of that organism. And those extracts clearly were containing the toxin, Shiga toxin. 
um, which is present in the Shigella and also is, is the one that uh, we find in Shiga toxin producing E. coli. And then between 1977 and 2011, we've got a range of research going on that's showing E. coli can produce Shiga toxin and it can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, and hemorrhagic colitis, bloody diarrhea. And this group of organisms tended to be uh, referred to as Shiga toxin producing E. coli, STEX, STEX, a whole range of names for them, or of course also VTEX. So how do all this mash together when we think about E. coli as a genus? Um, well, if you look at the big oval in the middle of that, the, the largest one, that's all the E. coli. And if we look at all the E. coli, most of those are harmless. And we use those in foods as indicator of, of hygiene and hygiene of production and hygiene of the food. And if we go within that, we have other little groups of, of um, E. coli. We have that group, uh, the, the left hand, top left hand little oval there, uh, of STEC, and those are E. coli that contain the STX genes. And these genes are the genetic elements that code for Shiga toxin, and those are STECs. We also have a, a group which we know as E. coli 0157. It's a serogroup, it contains the 0157 uh, um, uh, protein on the outer cell wall. Um, now, some of those 0157s also contain Shiga toxin genes. So some, 015, some 0157s are STEX. There are some that don't. There are some 0157s that are not Shiga toxin producing E. coli. We have another group which contain uh, this, this group of genes, this genetic element called the locus of enterocyte effacement, the LEE genes. Um, this is characterized by something called the AE. Uh, it's an attachment uh, gene that allows the gut, the, the organism to attach to the gut wall. So these things, these are organisms that might be able to cause bloody diarrhea. Now, some of those fall into the 0157 group, some of them fall into the STEC group. So we have this really complex mixture of E. coli that we can define differently dependent on their serology and the genes that they contain. And that's why the whole area of STEC is becoming more and more complex with time. And we'll talk about that later on. So how do these things make us ill? Well, many uh, shigatoxin producing E. coli contain these genetic elements that allow them to attach to the gut wall. If they do that, it can result in a breakdown of the gut wall, uh, effacement of the, of the microvilli, which cause a bloody diarrhea known as hemorrhagic colitis. And that can happen in up to 60% of cases of STEC infection. Those attached organisms can then produce shigatoxin. And the Shiga toxin will enter the bloodstream, it goes around in the blood and it can attack the kidneys and that can cause severe kidney damage. And somewhere around about 3 to 10% of all people affected with STEC infection will get some form of, of kidney involvement. The symptoms of Shiga toxin producing E. coli infection can, can start to appear anywhere around 3 to 4 days after eating a contaminated food, can be up to 10 days. And hospitalization um, may occur in up to 35% of cases, which tends to show the severity of the illness that, uh, that happens with the organism. And this uh, little um, uh, diagram really shows what I just said, uh, where we've got ingestion of the organism into the gut. We've got the attachment of the organism to the gut wall and effacement of the microvilli, which is that uh, bottom center photograph. Then the toxins entering the bloodstream, going around in the blood to the kidneys, causing kidney damage, in worst case is hemolytic remix syndrome uh, and, and, uh, and renal failure. So what about E. coli or STEX as an emerging pathogen? Um, we often talk about emerging pathogens and there, there are actually only very few real emerging pathogens that have happened. But actually STEC might just be considered as an emerging pathogen or emerged, recently emerged pathogen. The first isolation from a foodborne outbreak came only in 1982. Um, that's actually uh, just before I started working at Camden BRI, not that long ago. Uh, and it was about 1983 when we had the first isolation in the UK. So the question is, was it a new pathogen? Well, a lot of work was done by various public health laboratories, both in the UK, Canada and the USA, to review their culture collections of E. coli to actually say, well, have we seen this organism before? Has it been 
been been found and uh, put away in our culture collection and we've never really understood that we found it before and certainly in the UK um, Public Health England uh, did a, a review of about 15,000 isolates of E. coli that they had in their culture collection. Similar things were done in Canada and the USA. And they found E. coli 0157. Now 0157 is the, is the characteristic uh, classic Shigatoxin producing E. coli. Out of all of those isolates in the culture collections, they found only one in the UK, one in the USA and six in Canada from previous issues. So it would seem that 0157 and shigatoxin producing E. coli in general are a fairly recently emerged organism. It's thought that 0157 um, fairly recently emerged from um, uh, an E. coli 055 um, and a, an STX negative uh, enteropathogenic E. coli with an exchange of genetic material to create the classic E. coli 0157. So it's probably something that is relatively recently emerged as a pathogen. Now, if we start to look at the numbers affected, um, this, is, uh, this is data, very, very recent data actually, uh, from Europe um, of uh, shigatoxin producing E. coli in infections. And it's been, been uh, extracted from the uh, European Centers for Disease Control, One Health report. Um, from figures from 2019. It was only published in February 2021. So it's the most recent data we actually have. And this looks at the number of infections from STEX in Europe over a number of years. And you can see that we started in 2015 uh, with a reported number of about 5,900 cases. Um, that increased in 2016, dropped slightly off in 2017. It was a very worrying increase, 35% increase in, uh, in cases in 2018, up to 8,100. And it dropped back a little in 2019 to about 7,700. It's now um, the, the third most commonly reported zoonoses in Europe after Campylobacter and Salmonella. And it does have a seasonal trend, and we tend to see more infections occurring with STEX in the summer months than in the winter months or the cooler months of the year. So it is something that isn't going down. Uh, there's some evidence we might be seeing increasing numbers over time. How about foods? And again, the EU One Health report um, comes through and starts to give us information about uh, European sampling data from foods. Um, and uh, the number of, of positive, STEC positives that are actually being found. And if you look at the left-hand table that I've got in, in this slide, um, on the left-hand side, this is ready to eat food products. And it gives the number, number tested uh, within, within Europe and the percentage positives. And you can see there that we've got um, at 1.2% of all meat and meat products. And bear in mind, these are ready to eat products. Um, being found to be positive for shigatoxin producing E. coli. That 0.8% uh, milk and milk products, 0.08 fruit and vegetables and juices, at 0.3% herbs and spices and 0.35% salads. Now that, that's quite concerning because I say these are, these are noted to be ready to eat food products and we're seeing um, low levels of shigatoxin producing E. coli being reported. On the right hand side, that's the non ready to eat foods table. And as we might expect, we've got slightly higher levels of positive there with about 3.7% of meat and meat products and 3.8% of milk products being noted to be, uh, to be positive. So it's present there in the food supply within Europe, as we note by the most recent European data that we actually have. And it's even present and can be noted to be present in ready to eat foods. Um, this uh, particular slide looks at the top five sera groups that have been isolated. And again, it comes from that EU One Health report that was published in February of this year. Um, and it's really interesting because this is looking, if you look at the, at the top line, the top uh, horizontal line, um, the, the sera groups there, 0157, 26, 145, 103 and 111, are the groups that we tend to look for in Europe as the key sera groups of uh, shigatoxin producing E. coli. And you can see there in, in, um, in bovine, in, meat, in beef uh, meats, we've got levels noted of uh, 0157, 026, 0145, in fact, all of those major groups. But if you look at that, that um, vertical line that says any shigatoxin producing E. coli, we've got a mass 
of STECs that we're not actually seeing in that sera group list. These are um, shigatoxin producing E. coli's that aren't in that big five that we recognize. And there are a lot of them. And if you look at the very bottom horizontal line, this is the total number of shigatoxin producing E. coli's found in various foods. You know, we've got 616 STECs being found and barely 50, under 50, that are actually falling in that big top five group. So the question is, what are the others? There are the sera groups that are present. They're not the, the top five. We're probably not even serotyping them because we're only serotyping in many cases the top five. Um, but they're there and we must be aware as we start looking through this that when we're serotyping, we've got to start thinking that it's not just the top five uh, that we recognize in Europe that are important, there are going to be others coming through that we feel are important as well. Um, now, these, uh, this table is the sera groups uh, within Europe that have been shown to cause illness in time. And again, it goes back to what I said beforehand, it's not just the top five. And, <clears throat> excuse me, here we can see the number of cases and the percentage uh, of, of the total a number of illnesses, STEC illnesses that, is, that that particular sera group is responsible for. So 1157 is top 26.6%. But that means we've got around 74% of all illnesses that are caused by non-0157 shiga toxin producing E. coli. And you can see there that we've got uh, 026 at 16%. Um, these are non-NTs, non-typables, so that's 12.7%. We've got 0146, 0103, a whole range of different other sera groups that are responsible for causing foodborne illness within Europe that are not in that top five grouping. And again, we, we need to start thinking about um, which uh, STEC sera groups are important to us. And maybe is it the sera group that's important to us or is it the virulence of the organism? This um, is, is a, a script that came from an EFSA report that was published in January 2020. And it really gets to the crux of the matter. And the, the important bits, it's a wordy slide, the important bits I've highlighted in red. And this is what the EFSA have actually said about the importance of shigatoxin producing E. coli. And they say that isolates positive for any of the reported shigatoxin types, STX types, and encoding STX gene subtypes may be so associated with severe illness. So anything that contains a shigatoxin subtype of any type may be associated with severe illness. Um, it's also stating but strains positive for the STX2A gene show the highest rates of illness. And at the bottom, the key, uh, I think the absolutely key statement that it says is that sera group cannot be used as a predictor of clinical outcome. And the presence of the intermin EAE gene, this is the gene that uh, can tend to stick the organism to the gut wall, is not essential for severe illness to occur. So this is really blowing apart the old thought about which sera groups of E. coli are the ones I should be interested in. And it's opened up the fact that basically I should be interested in basically any E. coli that contains an STX gene. That's a shigatoxin producing E. coli. It could cause illness. Um, now, uh, the um, FAO-WHO uh, Joint Expert Risk Assessment Group, GEMRA, did a risk rating of STX. Um, uh, last year, I think it was. And they came out with this type of risk rating. And it's not related to sera group at all. It's related to which genes are present within the E. coli type. And the risk rating here is, is noted as one, two, three, four, and five. And the, the coding here is very simple for, for any microbiologist to understand. D is diarrhea. BD is bloody diarrhea, and HUS is hemolytic uremic syndrome or, or kidney failure. And uh, the risk rating basically is stating that if we're in uh, risk level one, um, then these gene combinations might be the important ones um, within an E. coli that would be responsible for that, th those clinical outcomes and risk rating one. Um, uh, risk rating two, which is the same uh, clinical outcomes, but maybe slightly less severe, 
with those genes, risk rating three is just diarrhea and bloody diarrhea without hemolytic uremic syndrome and those genes and so on. So this is starting to, to give us a, a guide to say that clinical outcome doesn't depend on serogroup at all. It depends on which genes you've got present, which pathogenicity determines you have present within the E. coli and which are present and which are absent give a great guide to the clinical outcome that you get from a shigatoxin producing E. coli. And um, in the um, uh, uh, One Health, the EC One Health report from uh, earlier on this year, we then have mention of something that they call virulo virulotypes, which is an interesting word, but it may be one we start to hear about even more. And this is looking at the type of E. coli dependence on the virulence, dependent on the virulence gene profile that you have. And it goes back to that previous GEMRA risk rating. Um, and it's looking at the data they have for 2019. And it's looking at which virulence gene profile is responsible for human uh, isolates, those guys that have caused disease, which are responsible for the uh, frequency of hemolytic uremic syndrome or kidney issues, uh, responsible for, high, for um, hospitalizations and bloody diarrhea. And it's starting to say, again, nothing to do with serotypes, serogroup. This is to do with which virulence genes you have present in the E. coli. And you can see there that uh, once we've got STX2 and EAE, we've got a large number of human isolates. We've got a large number of HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, and of hospitalizations. Uh, and a bloody diarrhea, but maybe not so much bloody diarrhea as, as once we've got STX1 and STX2 and EAE. So this is starting to define how we now are going to look perhaps in the future at the clinical importance of different types of STEC, not dependent on serogroup, dependent, but dependent on the, vir the virulence factors that they actually have present within them, which genes have they got. Um, and again, this is just looking again at the, the previous slide in a different way, looking at the gene profiles, um, really relating to independent STX types, shigatoxin types, um, 1A, 2A, 2C, and so on. And this goes through the, through the number of human isolates. And you can see again there, STX 1A, STX 2A, STX 2C, and STX 2C and 2A mixed give this very large number of, of human isolates clearly coming from are people that are quite severely ill from an E. coli infection. Um, so STX1, STX2 look to be more virulent types of STX than others. Um, but again, they can all cause illness. Um, this, is, this is looking uh, very generally um, at some significant outbreaks of, uh, of uh, shigatoxin producing E. coli that have occurred over time. Now, first of all, uh, hold my hands way up to you. This is not an exhaustive group of, of um, outbreaks. It's incredibly selective. There have been many outbreaks that have occurred um, over the, the years uh, that we recognize shigatoxin producing E. coli as a food pathogen. These are some selected types that give you an idea of serogroups and the types of food product that, the, the, or that have been causative for these types of food poisoning. And if we start way down at the bottom of the slide, back in 1996, um, only a few years after the organism was first really identified, um, we've got a, a linkage of 0157 in the USA with apple juice, um, causing about 70 illnesses and one death. Um, that was uh, fresh pressed apple juice, um, unpasteurized, often called apple cider in the, in the USA. Um, and uh, the issue was uh, the use of um, windfall apples that have been in contact with the ground, have been contaminated with uh, um, STEC 0157 from ground contact pressed, uh, and the organism wasn't inactivated and it caused illness. And there have been a number of, of outbreaks in the US linked to fresh pressed apple juice, or as, say, as they call it, apple cider. 1996, we have one of these, these huge outbreaks um, the biggest, certainly probably the biggest we've ever seen uh, in Japan, nearly 10,000 people, 11 deaths that were linked to radish sprouts, sprouted seeds. Um, uh, at that point linked to, uh, I think, a school lunch program, so feeding a younger population. 
1996, we had a, an issue with Cook Meats uh, in, in the UK with 0157 with 503 cases and, and 17 deaths. Um, uh, this was a, a particularly nasty one that occurred in Scotland, uh, and it was cross-contamination uh, at, a, at a larger butcher's shop um, where cooked meats had been cross-contaminated with raw, uh, which contained 0157, uh, and 17 people died, mainly elderly people. 2005, again in the UK, uh, this, is, this is widely known as the South Wales incident, 157 uh, people ill, one death, a young, young child being killed there by, by contamination. And again, this was cross-contamination in a uh, larger butcher's premises where cooked meats that had been sent out um, for various uh, school events and, and other types of, um, of uh, uh, eating event had been cross-contaminated within the butcher's shop um, uh, by, by raw meats that have been con uh, contaminated with 0157. 2011, we have the huge issue that happened in Germany um, with 0104, E. coli 0104, um, linked to sprouted fenugreek seeds uh, that came from uh, Egypt. Uh, this was a huge outbreak, uh, over, over 2,000, nearly 3,000 people affected, nine deaths. Um, and um, this, this was uh, a classic where really an unknown serotype, an unknown serogroup, 0104, um, which we weren't particularly interested in up until that point, suddenly came through, caused 3,000 illnesses in Germany and other parts of, um, of Europe. Um, and this was a, actually a, an EAE negative organism. Um, so it didn't have the EAE attachment gene, it had some other attachment genes present. 2013, we had an issue with watercress. Uh, in the UK, um, which was, I think, traced to runoff uh, of uh, animal manures into the watercress beds, uh, the animal manures being, being contaminated uh, with uh, uh, 0157 and then contaminating the watercress, which was then consumed and causing problems. Salad leaves come through there in the UK, 166 cases in 2016. Um, soy nut butters, um, completely different area there in 2017 in the USA, uh, causing 32 illnesses. And the USA over from, from about 2018, 19 and 20, have had a whole range of, of STEC, particularly 0157 incidences linked to lettuce and particularly Romaine lettuce, which have affected many, many hundreds of people over the, over the time. And again, that's tended at the moment to be considered to be an irrigation water issue with contaminated irrigation water from animal runoffs being used to irrigate these, these leafy crops. There was an 0103 issue uh, in ground beef in the US in 2019, of course, 209 illnesses. And we have flour popping up in 2019 in the USA. This is linked to uh, serogroup 026. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's clear that um, uh, flour was not being considered to be a raw agricultural product, which it is if it's not been treated. Flour is a raw agric agricultural product, uh, and we might not expect it to be free from enteric pathogens like sugar toxin producing E. coli. And in this case, uh, it caused 21 illnesses in the US. 2019, we had uh, 0103 and 0121 in the USA from bison meat causing 33 illnesses. And in 2020, we have a linkage in the UK of 0157 with cucumbers um, in, uh, eaten in the home or in fact in one particular fast food outlet, causing 36 uh, um, illnesses in that case. So, so it's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a flavor for the type of foods that might be involved in toxin producing E. coli uh, outbreaks. And the fact that it's not just 0157, that we're, uh, we should be interested in. It's, it's a range of other serogroups. So what are some of the problems that I foresee with, with our issues with, O1, with, with uh, Shigatopsin producing E. coli at the moment? Well, I think, first of all, there might be, and certainly was in the past, an over-reliance on trying to detect 0157 or the European big five serogroups and not thinking more broadly that all shigatoxin producing E. coli's are potentially a pathogenic risk. And the problem there is some of our detection methods limit what we can currently achieve. Um, we, we haven't actually got the methodology that helps us to detect um, some of these other serogroups and some of these other pathotypes or virulotypes 
um, of Shiga's oxymetry producing E. coli. A question, should we be looking for STEC plus other virulence factors, not just STEC and certainly not just 0157 or serogroup? And how can we risk categorized foods based on it? What is the significance of a presumptive positive Shiga toxin producing E. coli? If we're a food producer, what action should we take if we got a presumptive positive? It depends potentially if it's a ready to eat or a non ready to eat product, but it's, a, it's something we need to start thinking about quite seriously at the moment. We should definitely start looking more deeply than Sera Group when it comes to um, potential uh, pathogenicity of this particular group and start to look at uh, the presence of, of virulent genes that might be present. And finally, I guess in that, this particular slide, is 0157 testing now really completely redundant because we know other serogroups cause illness and we know it's really not serogroup dependent. It's based on a variety of virulent genes that are present, the type and seriousness of the illness. So what about what are our methods? Um, going back into to looking at methodology. And the problem that I think in the past is our methods have tended to be developed to be a reaction to legislation. And the legislation has been formed um, reflecting some of the major outbreaks that have occurred. So in the USA, we've got legislation from the USDA that surround beef and beef, uh, beef cuts, um, which actually start to look at this particular list of, of the big six plus 0157 as the ones they need to detect. In, in the EU, we have legislation uh, surrounding sprouted seeds um, with the European uh, group of, of O groups that need to be looked for. Um, but the problem we have is the methods uh, have tended to be developed to look for these legislated types of a sera group of E. coli. And these, in some ways, don't have relevance at the moment to our knowledge about what causes illness. They do, but there are others that cause illness. We have an ISO test method um, for Shiga toxin producing E. coli. It's a, it's a, a technical specification. And basically, it starts by taking um, a food, you put it into a growth broth, you incubate it, you then test that broth using a PCR reaction for Shiga toxin genes, STX genes. If it's negative, that's the end of the test. You've not detected Shiga toxin producing E. coli. If it's positive, that's called a presumptive STEC, and you have to continue the test. And the test is continued by taking the broth, doing immunomagnetic separation. You streak those uh, immunomagnetic beads onto various agars and incubate them. You then pick off the colonies that are formed, and you pen then test those individual colonies again using a polymerase chain reaction, a PCR test. If they're negative, then STX is, is not confirmed, it's not detected. If it's positive, it's confirmed. Now, the problem with the test is um, early on, we're looking at the broth for STX genes. Now, it's very possible that uh, those genes might not be present in particular E. coli. They might be present in other organisms. It's, it's known that certain phage actually contain STX genes. So we can't tie together the presence of STX genes within an E. coli by that testing on the broth that we originally do. That's why we have to go forward into immunomagnetic magnetic separation to try and pull out E. coli's and then test those isolated E. coli's again for STX genes. So we know then that we have an STX gene in an E. coli, that's an STEC. The problem we have is the IMS that we do is related to sera group. So we're again, not looking at all of the E. coli's, we're only looking at certain sera groups of E. coli's when we're doing this ISO test. In the future, um, there is a new ISO method being developed at the moment um, at, at the level of ISO. Uh, I doubt it will be published within the next 12 months. It's probably a 12 to 18 month program. And that will come out probably as a two-part method. That's what's under, developed, uh, under development at the moment, with part one uh, being detection of Shiga toxin producing E. coli in general, and part two being then detection of particular serial groups and virulence factors for those people that want to go and do a, a further test. There are a range of rapid methods available to us, and, and many labs that do uh, this type of testing will divert 
to using rapid methods rather than uh, the ISO method because they're just easier to use and get hold of. Um, we have a range of rapid methods for 0157 uh, based on immunoassays and nucleic acids, PCRs and so on. And we have a range for shigatoxin producing E. coli in general, again, most based on, on nucleic acid based test PCR. Problem with those, well, as I said before, is, is 0157 testing now actually redundant because it's just one serogroup and, and even then we know serogroups probably have nothing to do with pathogenicity, it's to do with the virilotypes. With shigatoxin producing E. coli rapid methods, I would say that most of the tests have been developed uh, in answer to legislative requirements. So they're looking for those particular serogroups, both in the US and in Europe, that legislation has legislated for, and not at the moment for that general group of any shigatoxin producing E. coli, any E. coli that contains an STX gene. The future, well, I think we're clearly on a path in the future where we're going to be looking for the detection of virulence factors rather than serogroups to define whether we have an organism we, we are going to be concerned about uh, and we have an organism that's likely or potentially likely to cause human illness. So some conclusions. Firstly, when it comes to STEC, the issue is certainly not just E. coli R157. When we look at all of the, of the cases of, of STEC illness, uh, O157 is in a minority of, of, of uh, causative agents for, for outbreaks, cases and outbreaks, certainly outbreaks within the EU and indeed the rest of the world. If we look at all of the other serogroups combined, they weigh ahead of just 0157 on its own. It's important, but it's not the only one. But the issue, as I said before, is more than just serogroup related. It depends on the presence of STX genes and the type of STX genes that, that are present. It depends on the presence of other path pathogenicity determinants like these uh, sticky genes, the EAE gene and, and others that allow the organism to stick to the gut wall. We clearly have a method related issue um, I, I really do think that 0157 as it stands at the moment potentially is a redundant test. Um, we, we should be looking much more widely um, at other serogroups and probably the presence of STX genes within E. coli in general. The detection method itself is complex. Um, it's the first time we as, as, as a, a group of, of scientists have actually started having to look more deeply than just an organism or a serotype of an organism and start to look at the presence of genes within the organism. And that complexity means the interpretation of test results is incredibly challenging. Um, it's in challenging, even in our lab where we've been doing this type of test for, for many years, it is a challenging test when it comes to looking at the, what the results actually mean and then advising uh, food, food producers on, on how the, what actions they should take when they get particular results. And that's the next bullet point, what actions you take. And you need to get those actions really carefully determined and established really before you ever start testing for shigatoxin producing E. coli. What are you gonna do with the various results you're likely to get? Last, last but one bullet point, serogroup might be a red herring. We should be looking deeper than serogroup when it comes to, to this group of organisms. And finally, we're still learning. We're still learning a huge amount very quickly. As we do more research, we learn more and more, and that makes it more, more interesting. More, we learn, we understand a lot more, but also I think it becomes more challenging for us to understand what we should look for and what we need to do with the results when we get them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Roy, for taking the time out to join us today and give us a very thorough, indeed, and interesting presentation on STEC. Um, and I suppose it's very interesting to see the wide range of food causing STEC outbreaks when we all think, I suppose, of beef as the main mm. food cause anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I suppose just to say to participants, if you've got a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen now and we'll make use of Roy's expertise while we still have him. Um, we have a number of questions in already there, so I'll, I'll kick off. 
Um, I suppose someone's saying, is the EU da data for STEC then underreported? Um, they're saying just that, just you mentioned the virulence factors and uh, they're saying, for example, the UK notify 0157 and not other STEC. So I, I, when they're not sure if it's the same in other countries, but yeah. Ireland indeed notifies all STECs. Yeah, um, I, I think um, absolutely, great question, absolutely correct. Um, when it comes to reported illnesses, um, it's unlikely there's a great deal of underreporting because people tend to be quite ill and therefore they're likely to seek medical help. And probably there's, there's less underreporting when it comes to illness. But when it comes to foods and food testing, spot on. Yep, um, because it, it will be completely dependent on the method that's used. Um, in the UK, we've seen numbers start to change gradually as the public health labs have moved from just purely testing 0157 to getting um, uh, PCR tests to test for a range of other serogroups. So absolutely, I would, I would imagine there is underreporting and the underreporting due to methodology being used. And as that methodology changes, I would expect to see the numbers um, of uh, positive foods gradually tend to go up because we're looking, we're looking more widely. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Roy. Someone's asking a more practical question. Is there any extra precautions a food business producing butter and cream from raw milk can take to reduce the risk of con contamination? It's a really difficult one with, yeah. with, um, with any raw dairy product, uh, certainly. It's, it's looking really at, um, it, it's, it's almost going back and doing your risk analysis right to the start. Um, it's the cleanliness, uh, it's the cleanliness right from the cattle, um, the, the udder hygiene, the milking parlor hygiene, um, temperature control then when, when you milk. So it really is going right back through the system and saying, if I'm not gonna do anything to my milk before I make it into something, and if there's no critical control point, such as a heat step, yeah. which is going to reduce the level of the organism, the hazard, then I've got to make sure I'm, I'm really paying phenomenal attention to the hygiene all the way through. Um, you, you certainly, testing can play a part. Um, routine testing can give uh, an idea of whether there's a, a, an issue around, but testing isn't the answer clearly when it comes to, to microbiological risk. It gives a part of, of some information you might find useful. Hygiene all the way through the system is really it. Perfect, thank you, Roy. Someone's asking, despite the large number of non 0157 related illnesses, is there a reason why main, the main outbreaks are mostly related to 0157? Oh, yeah. um, probably at the moment, it, it's because 0157, uh, the 0157 sera group um, contains those particular uh, virulence factors that are likely to cause illness. So potentially um, you may find maybe more 0157s contain uh, STX2 um, or 2A and DAE uh, than uh, other serogroups do. So it, it's probably down to that um, more than anything else. Perfect. Someone's asking, why have we seen so many outbreaks in the UK and US and not other nations? I did say quite early on that was not an exhaustive yeah. list. Um, so maybe it's simply because uh, as I've searched through things, the data coming out the UK and USA and, and the EU as well uh, are more easily obtainable than, than that's coming from other countries. Um, so uh, it's not an exhaustive list. I would imagine you'd find yeah. uh, STEC outbreaks in the countries as well. Perfect. Someone has asked, are there any studies looking at climate change, biodiversity and increasing problems with pathogens? That's a quite a... a very, very big topic. <laughs> huge, yeah. huge topic. Um, I, I, it's not a question that I could answer yeah. with any great deal of, of um, certainty. There will be an, a lot of... Um, research and work that's done on climate change. Um, it's there, I can't really comment on it any more than that because I'm not up to speed with whether there's been anything particularly done on pathogens in that sense. Clearly, as climate change happens, um, we will start to see shifts in microorganisms um, happening throughout the world, um, but I, I can't give you any certainty on it. 
Okay, so, sorry, Roy, we're throwing very specific questions out here. Someone yeah. has said in an early slide, you showed UE data for ready to eat meat and meat products. Do you know what percentage these were for raw ready to eat meat products such as steak tartare? Uh, no, I don't. Um, yeah, yeah. I can see it's from Fiona. Uh, yeah. the, the easiest thing is, yeah. is to go back and look at the uh, One Health report um, from which that, that particular uh, uh, table was taken. Um, I don't believe even in the One Health report, it will go into any more detail than just very broad groupings than, than, uh, than, than I presented there. Okay, and someone's asking, the risk management action for ready to eat food is relatively straightforward, but problems arise in relation to non ready to eat food. This was the main stumbling block for the EU Commission when they tried to elaborate on a guidance document for SDEC and food with the help of a member member state. So I don't know if that's a, a comment. Well, actually, I, let's go back to the beginning of that because the risk management action for ready to eat food is relatively straightforward. Is it? It is when you've confirmed, but what would you do if you were a producer of ready to eat food and you had a presumptive positive STEC? Okay. Is that straightforward? And, and that really comes back to that difficulty I said uh, in the later slides, which is um, interpretation of results and interpretation and actions taken from various types of result. Uh, and, and it really does go through because of the methodology and the difficulties in the methodology we have, we end up with this thing called a presumptive positive, which just means I've detected STX genes in a broth. I don't know where they're from. Yeah. What am I going to do with that? Um, do I, do I uh, quarantine all of that food if it's ready to eat? Maybe I, I should because the, the risk is huge. But what's the chances that STX PCR is from something completely unrelated? And I don't think we've really done enough testing in that format generally as, as a food industry to really understand how many times do we get those false positives from that initial PCR reaction on broth. So it, it, it's yeah. a really difficult one. Perfect. Someone is asking, do you, you know anything about STEC infections related to the practice of slurry, spreading slurry on farms and the subsequent infection? Of Actually, children, for example, no, no, yeah. no, I don't. I mean, it, it, it's clear that, um, I mean, it depends on the slurry and uh, clearly uh, slurry should be properly treated before mm -hmm. it's, it's actually spread. Um, people can pick up infections with STEC from environmental contamination. Um, there was a case I was reading about just this morning, uh, I think in the UK, uh, of a young child that was quite severely ill because they'd eaten seagull poo. Um, so uh, that's clearly an issue where an environmental contamination can cause illness. And, and years ago, I seem to recall something about um, even off-road cyclists um, being made ill because of the, the spray being thrown up from mud that they were cycling over. Um, and there, there's been issues with, with 0157 in various types of scout camp with people touching um, uh, uh, dried manure pats and then not having good hand hygiene before yeah. eating. So environmental contamination can occur uh, where organisms in the environment can directly contaminate people. So it's not out of the question. Perfect. Okay, someone's asking, what advice well, what is your advice to businesses who have SDEC detection on non ready to eat foods? Would what? Oh, sorry, it keeps moving. <laughs> what would your risk assessment look like for this product? Well, I think it goes back to somebody else mentioned about yeah. what, what the EU were, were doing and certainly what the UK FSA did some time ago about um, non ready to eat foods. And I think you, you, have to be, um, you have to be really aware of how that food might be used by. Uh, that might be the end consumer, it might be somebody else. And how certain can you be that that food is not going to be used in a way that either it cross contaminates other ready to eat foods or is not going to be treated in such a way as to eliminate um, the, the uh, estate contamination that might be present. So it really is looking forwards out there and making that, that quite difficult decision how is it going to be used? If I have any doubt whatsoever of the, of the method of, of food preparation or cross-contamination and use, 
and then you've got to start thinking about not releasing food onto the market. So it's looking forwards and making a risk judgment on potential use. Okay. Okay, we have a lot of um, technical questions. Someone's asking, I would like to ask your advice regarding selective agar for E. coli 026, that they're currently using Chromo on 0157 and Ramnos McConkey agar, and they're having issues sourcing the, the Ramnos McConkey agar. Okay, agar. Uh, yeah. Difficult one to answer. It's quite technical, so I, I, I yeah. don't know if you could go into that. Yeah, okay. We'll. Um, move on there's a good few technical questions here but i don't know maybe we could get back to people on the the really technical ones yeah, uh, yeah we could afterwards do, perhaps yeah um what would you do in a one health approach to reduce stec illness oh dear um i i think it's you've got to start going back to the very beginning of, of where does it come from and and how does it contaminate food products um so it, it's it's the same for any uh, any pathogen of, in, in many cases. Um, first of all, pre prevent the pathogen being present uh, on the food to start with. So look at good agricultural practices. Um, look at how do we stop uh, enteric pathogens like E. coli and, and uh, STEX being present on that to start with. And then going through and saying, and, and what are the factors then when I handle that food subsequently that is gonna further increase my um, happiness in safety and prevent cross-contamination. So from, from that approach, the, the One Health approach, it goes really right back to agriculture and saying, what factors can I start to take to prevent contamination of food in the first place? Um, because the, the best thing to do, if we can produce food that doesn't contain this in the first place at the agricultural level, it will not be a problem later on. Um, but then build in the appropriate controls afterwards. Okay, thank you, Roy. Someone's asking, are animal herds tested for STEC? Um, there, I'm not sure there's any um, official testing required I, out, out of my area on, on um, yeah, okay. animal testing. Um, certainly, there's a lot of testing that does go on, but I'm not sure uh, on official controls at all whether that's required. Okay, and um, there's there's a question on water, and water appears to be, as we know, the main issue yeah. of STEC outbreaks in the Republic of Ireland. But someone's asking, are there any moves to monitor legislate in this area? But obviously, that's not your your it, it, area. It's out, really out yeah. of my out of yeah. my area. Yeah, it's a, yeah. a legislation area. Yeah. So let me see. Is there any UK working on the development of virulo type test methods for foods? Um, no, I mean, as far as method development is concerned, um, the, the key method, which would be the ISO method, uh, is being developed by the Community Reference Laboratory for, for Shigatoxin producing E. coli in Italy. Um, and that, that's being discussed at the ISO level. Um, my, my guess is, that, and the problem is, when people develop then rapid methods, you have to have a method to try and compare the rapid method to, to see if it's, um, uh, valid for use. Um, so I think rapid methods will then follow afterwards when we have the, um, when we have the ISO method. I, I've, I've certainly in my conversations with various rapid method producers, I, I've been encouraging and saying we, we all should be looking at methods that give us a good detection of Shiga toxin producing E. coli as a primary answer. Forget Sira group, forget SDX type to start with, we should be looking for methods that detect Shiga toxin producing E. coli because that's the answer that the food industry is going to need to make their primary decision on what to do with the food product. We follow up then with the rest afterwards and decide what serogroups, groups, what STX types and so on. Perfect. Do you know what, Roy? The, the rest of the questions are quite technical, so I think we might pass them on and see if you can answer them. They're quite um, technical in terms of microbiology. Okay. So um, we might just wrap it up there. So thank you so much for taking the time to um, answer all those questions. I don't think we've ever got so many questions coming at us actually <laughs> in a webinar before. So that's really good. Um, 
And just I suppose to let everyone know that um, the webinar recording will be available on the Safe Food Knowledge Network website shortly. And if you haven't signed up already, you can do so for free at safefoodkn.net. And also all participants will receive a link to the webinar recording and a feedback form, as Tracy mentioned earlier. And we'd really appreciate it if you take a few minutes to fill it out for us, because it really does inform our future events. And again, to just to finally thank Roy for really giving us a really in-depth um, overview of STEC in food. Thank you so much, Roy. Absolutely. We've had lots of really, really positive uh, feedback about the presentation, Roy. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's great. great. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone that's listened, because um, exactly. it's, uh, <laughs> it's not very good sitting here talking if there's not lots of people listening. I can see by the questions, there's a lot of people out there yeah. with uh, listening a with a lot of questions. So thank you all. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and we'll conclude the webinar and uh, as Mairead said, keep an eye out for our up future upcoming events. Thank you to everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye.